Hello everyone, this is Eye on Africa for Monday, September 19th. Here are the headlines. Senegal gets a new prime minister as part of a government reshuffle. President Macky Sall hopes to convince he can bring change ahead of the presidential elections in 2024. As Queen Elizabeth II is buried, some are not mourning the late monarch. Coming up, our reporters talk to survivors of the Mau Mau uprising when some one million people in Kenya were sent to concentration camps by British colonial forces in the 1950s. And the leader of Tunisia's opposition party is interrogated by police with dozens of people protest against, against the questioning of Rashid Ghannouchi. Good to have you with us. We begin in Senegal, where the new government has officially taken office today with a fresh face, Amadou Ba, named as prime minister. The governing coalition lost 45 parliamentary seats in an election last July, only just managing to cling on to a majority. President Macky Sall hopes that this reshuffle of government ministers will help to win over hearts and minds with just 17 months to go until presidential elections. Elimando Sarasako and Sam Bradpiece have the story. Senegal's new government has got people talking in the streets of the capital, Dakar. Amadou Ba, a close ally of President Macky Sall, heads up a fresh team of 38 ministers, some unknown to the public. I'm enthusiastic and I hope these changes can make a positive difference. I don't really have an opinion on them. I think they were probably politically savvy. We're waiting to see whether the Prime Minister and his government can bring any answers to the problems that Senegalese people suffer from on a daily basis. This new team has been spun as a government of struggle, ready to tackle inflation and youth unemployment, two of the most pressing issues of the day. Umar Yum, the leader of the governing coalition's parliamentary group, says the new ministers will be up to the task. We are living through a time where we need to reassure a population that has been hit by a social crisis and weak purchasing power caused by external shocks. This government has understood the message from the voters. This new team is composed of men of experience, true statesmen who are not here to mess around or waste lots of time. The reshuffle comes just weeks after legislative elections in which the opposition performed strongly. Some analysts say that with 17 months to go before the next presidential election, the government will struggle to turn this trend around. The government seems to have woken up to the needs and worries of the Senegalese people as far as youth unemployment and purchasing power is concerned. These problems require structural reforms, and I'm not sure if it can be done in 16 or 18 months, given we couldn't manage in the space of 10 years. For the time being, the main opposition group has not reacted to the reshuffle. Investigators with the United Nations say they believe Ethiopia's government is behind ongoing crimes against humanity in the Tigray region. In its first report, the Commission of Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia says it has found evidence of widespread violations by all sides. Fighting erupted in the northern Tigray region almost two years ago in November of 2020. The commission was created last December and is made up of three independent rights experts. It explains that it has reasonable grounds to believe that violations that were witnessed over the past two years amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. That includes persecution on ethnic grounds. The Ethiopian government has denied around 6 million inhabitants access to basic services such as internet and banking for more than a year. As you probably know by now, Queen Elizabeth II was buried this Monday, marking the end of a 10-day period of mourning for the United Kingdom. We've been reporting on the reaction in Africa and the intricate links between the royal family and colonization. Well, since the monarch's death on September 8th, many victims have reiterated calls for reparations and for the British government to acknowledge the atrocities they committed. That includes many Kenyans. The Queen began her reign shortly before the Mau Mau uprising when a million people were put in concentration camps by British colonial forces throughout the 1950s. Vivian Wandera and Bastien Renouy met one of the surviving freedom fighters. In this farm lives one of the most prominent Mau Mau generals family. Centenarian Mudoni Madenge remembers vividly when the Mau Mau rebellion started. This was just at the beginning of Queen Elizabeth II's reign. I was beaten by several policemen and they kidnapped my daughter. One of my hands was struck by a gun. 
And they hit my leg several times with an axe. Here and here. They called me fat and another soldier just kept hitting me. In 2013, the British government paid 22.9 million euros to over 5,000 elderly Kenyans who suffered abuse and torture during the rebellion, a fraction of the victims. Mudoni did not receive anything. The government of the British is there. They know the transgression that they went through and they have a duty to compensate those mamas who are left. She was hoping to get a compensation before the Queen died. Though she does not exactly blame Queen Elizabeth II for what happened, she is angry with the colonial police who oppressed them. Violence broke out. At the time, I was with a man called Kigongo and his three girls. Later, they all died. Many people were being killed by the British government. After Kenya gained independence in 1963, the British left with all the documents and records of the colonial era and its crimes, only making a few of them available in 2011. Anywhere we have been able to preserve our records, it is quite, quite moving. It is quite disgusting. It is not something that you can be able... The victims of the so-called the Mau Maus, the freedom fighters, to date, they have a case against the British government. The Queen's death has raised mixed feelings about her reign, with renewed calls for the British government to acknowledge the atrocities committed during colonialism. Spanish charity Open Arms has rescued 402 people seeking to cross the Mediterranean this weekend alone. It also recovered the body of a man who had been shot by smugglers. The rescue ship Open Arms Uno remains at sea and, according to the latest information, is seeking a port for the rescued people. According to a spokeswoman for the organization, some of them need medical attention and many are suffering from dehydration. The largest rescue this weekend happened when the boat picked up close to 300 people, mostly Egyptians, who were on an overcrowded barge south of Malta. The leader of Tunisia's opposition party, El Nahda, appeared at a police station in Tunis this Monday to answer questions over what his party says are accusations related to terrorism. Dozens of protesters gathered outside the station to demonstrate against the questioning of Rashid Ghannouchi. Laurent Bersacher has the details. Summoned and questioned by Tunisia's anti-terrorism unit, Former Prime Minister Ali Laradie denounced a fresh attempt to silence the country's leading opposition party. This operation is clearly aimed at undermining the opposition, led by Enahda, and at shifting the public's attention away from Tunisia's real problems. The leader of Enahda, Rashid Ghanouchi, was also questioned on Monday over what his party says were terrorism-related accusations. The Anahda party is suspected by its rivals of having facilitated the departure of thousands of jihadist fighters to Syria, Iraq and Libya in the past decade. Last month, two Anahda members, as well as several Tunisian security officials, were arrested over the probe. But the party, which categorically denies the allegations, has denounced an attempt by President Kais Sayed to discredit it and ramp up pressure on its members. Since his election in 2019, Syed has considerably tightened his grip on power while repeatedly leveling accusations of corruption and terrorism against Inahda. After shutting down parliament last year, he oversaw the adoption of a new constitution reinforcing presidential powers, a move his opponents described as an anti-democratic and authoritarian maneuver. The Parliament of Uganda is considering a bill that would make it possible to perform organ transplants in the country. If it happens, it would change the lives of thousands of people waiting for surgery. So far, only South Africa, Tunisia and Kenya have the regulations in place to allow transplants to take, pl to take place in their countries. Ugandans looking for a transplant mostly travel to India and Turkey for the operation. Well, earlier, our producer Aline Botin spoke to Samuel Aledo, head of Uganda's medical association, he told her what those changes could mean for doctors and patients. The costs involved in procurement, movement, travels, accommodation and expenses is overwhelming. Efforts were put into Mulago National Referral Hospital. It was upgraded 
to a super specialized center. So this was a preparation so that when the organ transplant bill is passed in this financial year, in this financial year, it is implemented or like you implement it immediately, not passing it and then starting to set up uh, equipment, starting to set up facilities, training. No, we have the trained staff. We have a good workforce. We have the facility, uh, the pioneer facility, which is Mulago National Referral Hospital, and actually private hospitals, which are coming on board. Finally tonight, the 15th Sema International Festival for Spiritual Singing and Chanting is currently underway in Cairo. It began on Saturday with choirs from different religious backgrounds singing on stage. The performance combined the Christian and Muslim hymns of various traditions into one orchestral sound. Egypt is home to several Christian communities, including the Copts, who are estimated to make up 10 to 20 percent of the country's population. It is also home to Greek Orthodox, Catholic, Maronite and Protestant communities. The festival continues across Cairo until this Saturday, September 24th. That wraps up Eye on Africa for this Monday. Thank you for watching. Uh, the news continues on France 24 right after this. On France 24, watch exclusive interviews with the world's most influential personalities. We need to act together because we're protecting our freedom. Encounters with key political leaders. La quiétude, elle est euh, extrême. Leading figures from the worlds of culture, sport and science. La science, la recherche, la découverte, le progrès, c'est important, c'est pas des c'est pas des mots qui sont vides. Whatever you think is right, you can do. Watch the interview, a meeting of ideas on France 24 and france24.com. Liberté, égalité, actualité.